Well, we appreciate being here in Iowa, and I want to say thank you and give some thanks and honor where honor is due, and I want to thank Pastor Weaver for being obedient. I'm already crying already, and I haven't even started, but for being obedient to the voice of God to allow a church to exist here for such a time as this. And so, Pastor, I honor you. Thank you for listening to the voice of God. And you and I have something in common, other than our good looks. It's the fact that uh, following Jesus is the best decision we've ever made in our life. And watching what God can do when we just simply obey him. And so I want to honor you, Pastor, and Pastor Jeff, and the team here, and um, some of the best youth pastors in the country, Pastor Zach and Pastor Luke, who are leading the youth ministries here. Um, it's, it's a real honor to watch uh, young men who love Jesus grow in the Lord and give a safe, given a safe place to expand and um, be passionate and all in for Jesus and to grow in a, in a place like this. It's amazing. And so um, this church is like family to my wife and I. <laughs> I feel like every year I'm just waiting for that phone call to ring and it's Pastor Zach. Hey, Mike, are you free this Wednesday night? <laughs> hey, can you come on down? And so... Uh, this church has been like family. I cannot tell you how many times after Monday night service and Tuesday night service, there are different people coming up to us um, doing the little holy handshake where they slip a little dollar bills in there and they say, thanks for coming. And I think really what it is to me, it speaks to my family and I, is it's the character and DNA of this church that is generous. It's the DNA of this church, and I've seen that played all throughout missions, but it's really been a blessing to my wife and I. Some exciting news about our ministry. Some of you, this is the first time you've ever heard me, and it's Wednesday night, so this is the night you decided to come to church. My wife and I travel on the road full-time as evangelists, not because we sought it out, but just because God told us to go and do it, and we've been obedient to that. And our family has expanded. We have two children. We typically like to travel with a nanny, and we own a 2002 Honda Accord and a 2005 Honda Civic. So can you imagine packing all of our belongings in there, trying to fit a nanny in there? It's near impossible. So we are nearing and closing in on buying our first ever van. I can't believe I'm going to be a dad van guy, but I am. But we are going to be buying our first ever van in our family, and we will travel across the country. Within one year of saying yes to Jesus, we put over 50,000 miles on our little Honda Civic in just one year of traveling the country and going where God wants us to go. We don't do this because there's a lot of money involved. We do this because this was God's plan for us and where he's ordered our steps for such a time as this. That's why we do it. And so for us, it's been an honor to be here to watch God bring about more, in heaven, more of heaven in you, to see God bring about more of heaven over our families and over this next generation. And to me, what makes it all worth it is a man who came up to me tonight and said, hey, Mike, I just want to say thank you for being here. I've decided I'm going to start a prayer room in our house where I can go and visit with God. To me, that's what it's about because that is fruit that will remain and that is fruit that will last. Every time you pray and seek the face of God, sometimes we go to God hoping other things will change around us, but every time you pray and seek the face of God, it will always change you. It will always change your mind. It will always change your heart. So I looked at him and said, get ready to be changed because God's going to change your heart. God loves to meet with ordinary people who desire to set aside time and meet with him and spend time with him. And we've had a really amazing last two nights together, and I'm really excited about where God's going to be bringing us tonight and God's heartbeat for the world, God's heartbeat for Urbandale, God's heartbeat for our city right here and now. I brought some pictures that I want to kick off with. Before you put up the first picture, I want to start in Genesis 1. It says, in the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Verse 3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. The very voice of God was what took something that was nothing and made it into something. The very voice of God has power in it. It has the power to create within an instant. It has the power to heal within a moment. The voice of God is more powerful than anything else. And when God spoke, things happened. Whenever God would speak, if you notice in Scripture in the New Testament, it will often say, and Jesus spoke with a loud voice. 
Whenever it was accompanied by the loud voice, something dynamic was about to hit earth. God spoke, said, let there be light. Boom, earth was created. God created man and woman in his image. God called it good. God called it very good. And then you see the serpent show up in Genesis chapter 3. And ever since that moment in time, the serpent, in other words, the devil, has been trying to confuse, has been trying to deceive, has been trying to bring about lies, has been trying to attack and come against everything that God called pure, everything that God called beautiful, and has attempted to sidetrack all of it. So much so that the reason why you and I experience hardship, sin, the reason why you and I experience evil in the world is not because God is evil, but the reason why we experience evil in the world today is because of a word called sin. And sin has gripped the world. There's no person in here who is not like the other because every single person in the room was born into something called sin. It's very easy to sin because it's in our nature. So it's natural to want to sin. All you need to do is look at a little toddler and listen to a parent, try to parent them and say, go, pick up your bottle. And they're like, nah, okay? You find out right away that we're all born sinners. Well, I brought some pictures today that show the demonstration and the playing out of what sin has created in our world today. And you can put up the first picture. This is a picture of a boy overseas who deals with malnourishment every day, and the tears are not because of abuse or neglect or those kinds of things, but he has loving parents back home. The reason for the tears is because this boy knows what it means not to have meals that are hot and ready on his plate, but this boy goes without meals regularly to the point where he is malnourished and does not know if he will live the next day or not due to a lack of food or proper food in his culture. Why are there malnourished kids in the world today? It's because of sin. The next picture. This is all too real as I visited this place with my very own eyes, as I've got to travel overseas and watch as children. Imagine your kids who get to take clean showers or baths at night, or they get to open the fridge and there's a water dispenser there and they get to drink clean water. I have watched with my own eyes as people will dig with ladles into the ground of water, the same water that the animals feed of, the same water that uh, the animals uh, bathe in, and that's the water they drink and it's the water they cook with. You and I wake up not wondering where our next drink of clean water is going to come from. You and I never wake up wondering if I'm going to get a shower or not. But you and I wake up and we don't say, or we say we have no idea what to wear when we have closets full of things. Our houses are full. Our fridge is full. If you have a very bed to sleep on, you are rich. If you have a very car that you drive, you are rich. Even the people living on food stamps or government aid in our country today is a lot more rich than the things that exist in our world today. Why do young kids die due to water-related diseases? It's because of sin. The destruction of sin in our world ever since the beginning of time. Next picture. This is all too common that we see in war-torn countries, but you see people not able to agree, and the result of war is somewhere along the lines, pride got in the way of a leader's heart, or destruction was brought about, or some sort of evil was brought about in a land that the retaliation factor leads to war. But the pictures you often don't see are the next picture. Put up the next one. A man who once had a house where he would go back to from work and be with his family, and now under the rubble as he comes back is his family underneath the rubble. Not only does he not have a house, but now he no longer has a family. Why in the world do we have wars today and pictures like this that exist in the world? It's because of sin. Next picture. This one breaks my heart, and this one is all too real, but these are a bunch of babies in orphanages where places like Haiti and all over the world, moms cannot provide for their kids, so in their mind, they think if they get rid of the kid, or if they put them on the streets, or if they put them in a dumpster, that it would be better off for that baby not to be in the house because the mom cannot financially provide. And so in turn, you have these workers that walk into countries looking for babies on the streets, looking for babies in the dumpsters, not wanted, not able to be provided for. And as my sister describes it, as she went to Haiti, she said she would walk down an orphanage like this with rows of babies. And as my sister would walk down and the babies could hear her footsteps, the babies would take their hands, throw them up, and immediately start screaming. And the reason why they would scream is because they desired to be held by somebody. Yet one sister, my sister, one woman, could not nearly hold every single baby that exists in an orphanage today. 
God's heart breaks for the orphan. God's heart breaks for the fatherless. God's heart breaks for the widow. And this reality exists today because of sin. Next picture. Adolf Hitler, a lot of you recognize this picture. But a man who had an intent to kill, a man who had an intent to wipe out a race, a people group, the Jews, such an anger, just by somebody's hair color or color in their eyes, he would execute them, lead hundreds of thousands of people to gas chambers. And some of you might know this man all too well, either because your father served or you may have served potentially in World War II. Some of you know what it is like to exist in the world and hear of these kinds of war crimes. And why in the world would this man bring about such execution and evil in the world today? But it's because of sin. Next picture. You and I, for some of us, this is an all too real occurrence. Whether at home behind closed doors where your kids don't see. But the bickering and the anger and the jealousy and the hatred and the pride and the different things that exist in homes between family dynamics, between mom and dad. Some kids, their story is this story right here. Knowing that they're going to leave New Hope Church, go back to a home, and they really don't want to go back home because what they're going to hear before they fall asleep at night is potentially this. Next picture. And the result is broken marriages. We talked about this last night, but marriage represents a covenant between man and woman and God. And the enemy is after covenants in the world. And why do we have broken covenants? But because of sin. Next picture. And what's the result to cure and what's the result to cover up just to merely get by and cope through life and the things that we have to go through, yet we really easily resort to drugs and we spend millions of dollars on drugs, some of them prescribed and yet some of them illegal, just hoping to get the next high or hoping to forget the last thought or the last memory or the last wound. We resort to drugs because the only way we know how to cope is to be addicted to something and some other substance that literally steals and kills and destroys our life. Why? Because of sin. Next picture. This one breaks my heart. As young girls today, all over the world, and not just all over the world, but right here on Interstate 35, are being put into semis. A lot of them taken out of St. Cloud, Minnesota. A lot of girls taken out of the Mall of America in Minnesota. My sister was attempted to be trafficked right outside her work, right outside her job at Mall of America more than once. Young girls who seem to be easier to target or easier to approach will be approached, be abused, victimized, and this trafficking exists in the world today. I happen to go to Thailand, see a 50-year-old European businessman, and he bought two girls under the age of 12, and those were his girls for the week. And I watched as these girls would put grapes in his mouth. And this is the things that exist in our world today, the injustices that exist in the world today. And the reason why is because of sin. Put up the next picture. Perpetrators. For some of this, all too well. One out of five women in the United States have been abused. One out of five women in the U.S. has either been emotionally, verbally, physically or another word, I'm not going to say abused. I'm really trying to use discretion in our time together, as I know there are children in the room. The reason of this is sin, and you want to know what it leaves people in America and around the world saying? It leaves us saying this. Next picture. It leaves us saying, help. Help. Yet some people don't have the guts Yet some people have too much of a pride where the last thing they want to ask for is help. Because to ask for help is a sign of weakness. Yet if somebody could write a giant theme on their life right now, maybe, just maybe, the words that could be on it displayed as a banner of their life is help. Or maybe you and I might be sitting in the pews today here at church on a Wednesday night and maybe you and I don't resonate with this word help. But I guarantee you this. The co-workers, the people you work with every day, the people that walk the halls of your school in high school and junior high, the people around the world are living in the present day reality of sin and they're begging the question, is this all that life is meant to be? Somebody help. The solution to healing a heart will never be medicine, although it can help. 
the solution to healing a heart, a heart that's far away from God, has always been one solution and one solution only. But it's been our Messiah and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who came to this world over 2,000 years ago. You can put up the next picture on the screen. But when he hung on a tree and took the sins that so many of us deserve, every single one of us deserve, upon his back. A crown of thorns put inside of his head, a whip with glass shards and rocks at the end of the whip, dug into his back, flesh torn out. Some of us forget the bloody mess of a man named Jesus who died on the cross for the sins of the world. Not just for our sins, but for everybody to walk the earth. I thank God for the solution that exists today for man who desperately is crying out, help. I'm thankful for the grace of Jesus that has covered us, that has washed us, that has cleansed us, that has purified us, that has bought us and purchased us to where our bodies are no longer our own, but we now have found the solution in Jesus Christ. Only Jesus can bring about healing to the injustices you saw on the screen but Jesus is no longer walking the earth today. Jesus is not in human flesh in our services today. But 50 days after Jesus died on the day of Pentecost, he said he would pour out his spirit on all flesh. And in an upper room, there were believers there gathered together praying, and the Holy Spirit baptized and filled the believers. And that day, the church was marked when 3,000 people came to follow Christ. God's solution for the world today God's plan today is an open invitation for every single person to experience the gospel, the good news of his saving grace for his life, but it does not stop at saying yes to the gospel. God beckons you and I into a relationship with him to bring about heaven here on earth and in our city through ordinary people like you and I, amen? God challenges us. The solution and invitation exists for every single person in the room. Yeah, but Micah, you don't know my past. You don't know where I've been. Yeah, but Micah, I don't have my ministerial license. Yeah, but Micah, I'm not a pastor. No, you don't understand. This is your first point tonight if you're taking notes. God is looking for people that are available. He's looking for someone that's available. Tonight where our text is, and where we see more of heaven here on earth and here in our cities is laid out in all four gospel accounts. Tonight, the miracle that we'll be looking at is the only miracle that is in every single gospel account ex beyond the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. This is the only miracle that's in all four gospels. You better believe if all four gospel writers are including in a miracle in every single one of them, this miracle was huge and it was important. And here in this story that we're going to be covering today unlocks the principles of what it means to see more of heaven here on earth and more of heaven here in our city. If we can catch this, if we can catch God's heart on how he trained up the 12 and the disciples who followed him closely, this will spill out into everywhere that we go. You see Jesus in Luke chapter 9 sent out the disciples. He gave them power and authority to drive all demons to heal diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and heal the sick. If you have ever wondered what your purpose here on earth is, your purpose here on earth is to go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let's take a time out right there. I ask this with all grace possible in my heart to you. Who are you discipling right now? I ask this with extreme grace in my heart. Who are you discipling right now? Every believer that follows Christ should be able to answer that question right there. Who are you discipling? Who are you raising up? Who are you reaching? If you've ever wondered what your purpose is, your purpose is not merely to avoid sin and inch your way into heaven. But your purpose is to know what it means to rule and reign with the power and authority of Jesus living inside of you. We are to taste, see, and know the goodness of God not only for us, but the goodness of God released around us. One of the reasons this is not research-based, this is merely Micah's theory. 
So after I get done saying this, you could crimp, crinkle it all up and just chuck it away. One of the reasons why I feel like young people walk away from Jesus and never return back to him, or people in general for that matter, is because I believe they've only tasted one aspect of Jesus, but not the full Jesus. One aspect of Jesus is to receive his grace and mercy for our sin. The other aspect of Jesus is to allow the Holy Spirit and Jesus inside of you to live through you to a world that's dying. And when you experience and taste and you watch Jesus speak through your life into somebody else, it grips you forever. It gets a hold of you because you're actually living it out. I ask this next question with all the grace in my heart. Who was the last person you led to Christ? Who was the last person you loved enough to say, hey, let me pray for you? Jesus sends out the disciples. Can you imagine this experience? They have a really successful ministry trip. Demons are being casted out. People are being healed. They're so excited. Oh, did you see what happened to Peter? Peter walked by a person and the person got healed. Oh, did you see what happened to James? James preached and over 30 people believed in Jesus as the Messiah. Can you imagine how exciting it was for these disciples to go, have all the power, have all the authority inside of them, and see these things take place in their ministry? And listen to how intentional Jesus is in Luke chapter 9, verse 10. It says, when the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. Jesus, you're not going to believe it. we got to tell you what we got to do. And it says, then he, Jesus took them with him, and they withdrew by themselves to a town called Bethsaida. Did Jesus come, report to Jesus what they had done? Jesus says, time out. Come with me. We're going to withdraw, and we're going to get away. And I'm sure the disciples, when they hear the word withdraw, oh, Jesus is going to take us away. It will be just us and Jesus, then we can tell them every story. Jesus takes the disciples away after they reported what they'd done. And listen to this. It says in verse 11, but the crowds learned about it and followed him. He welcomed them, spoke to them about the kingdom of God, and healed those who needed healing. Let me just tell you something. Jesus, being omniscient, fully God and fully man, knew full well that the minute he brings them to Bethsaida, a crowd is going to await them there on the shore. The disciples, though, not being omniscient, is like, oh, this is great. We're going away with the Jesus, a little field trip. Maybe we can rest and relax from our time of great ministry that we had, of seeing diseased people healed, demons casted out. This will be a great experience. Awesome. And then the minute they show up to Bethsaida, a large crowd of people are there. And Jesus demonstrates something to us that brings about more of heaven on earth in our city right here in this text. Jesus shows his availability to people at all times everywhere. Jesus demonstrates, yeah, I told you that we were going to withdraw, but you're going to about to figure out why in the world I even came to this world. And it says that Jesus welcomed them, spoke to them about the kingdom of God, and healed those who needed healing. The things that marked the ministry of Jesus was the preaching of God's word. It was the preaching that the kingdom of heaven was here. Jesus always taught. He always preached. And the other thing that marked Jesus' ministry is demonstration of his power here on earth right now. Jesus made a demonstration not just to the people. Jesus demonstrated to the people closest to him that he was available at all times. Your availability in this world here on earth can literally unlock the supernatural for somebody next to you. Your availability, not your spirituality, not how spiritual you are, just your availability can bring about a miracle in somebody else's life. I wonder what person in 2019 will offer themselves up to God to every day to say, God, I'm available for you to interrupt me. God, I'm available for you to inconvene my life. Most miracles came out of an inconvenience and wasn't planned. It happened along the journey and along the way and along the pathway. I wonder what people in the room will say, God, make me available in the classroom. I know of teachers where they can't preach Jesus in the school. 
but teachers will take it as their mandate that every child that steps foot in their classroom, they will begin praying for that child by name, under their breath. What is that teacher doing? But they're merely making themselves available. Your youth pastors don't just preach here on a Sunday morning, they live it out. They go to the local high school here in Urbandale. They go to the middle school. What are they doing? They're making themselves available. Available for what? For God to move and God to intervene. God does not take the qualified or those with the degrees. God takes the available and then qualifies them. God takes those who have a heart to say, God, here am I, send me. I'm available, God. And by the way, one of the most dangerous prayers you can ever pray is, God, here am I, send me. How do I say that and why do I say that? Well, I worked for Best Buy many years. I worked in the public marketplace. For seven years, I worked at Best Buy. God gripped my heart for about 130 employees that I worked with. I one day sent a company email out, company-wide. I hit send, describing the gospel. I get a phone call five minutes later from the general manager. He pulls me in his office. He said, what was that email you sent out? And I said, hey, God saved my life. I can't sit here anymore, not working with these people without them knowing. He said, I want you to know, I'm going to have to write you up for this. In another write-up, you'll be gone. But he said, I'm a believer too, so give me a fist pump. Boom. He's like, I have to write you up, but I commend your faith. Little did I know that that one email would be a seed for an opportunity of God just to speak to my coworkers. I was driving home from a store party one night. The employees offered me to stay back, drink some beers with them, and hang out with them. I said, no, I'm good. I'm just going to go home. I got in my car. They all went to the bar to go hang out. As I'm getting in my car, there was a burning desire in my heart just to see more of God, more of heaven, here with my coworkers. I was like, God, there's got to be something more than alcohol and going to the bars every night. God, would you use me? I started praying this in my car right back. God, would you use me in my coworker's life? And I hear the Spirit whisper to me, Micah, turn around in your car and go back into that bar and tell them all about me. And right when I heard that whisper, I turned up the volume in my car on the radio and blasted as loud as I could. I ignored that. I said no. I drove home. I got out of my car. I shut the door. And I heard the Spirit whisper to me again, do it now. I started taking one step up the stairs. I heard it louder. Do it now. I stepped up the final step. I heard it the loudest ever. Do it now. I completely ignored it. I went inside, opened up the door to my house. There was my sister Brittany, the last person I wanted to see because she's a very black and white person. She sees how downcast my face is. The first thing she asked me, Micah, what's wrong with you? And I said, Britt, I feel like God's telling me to go back to the bar where I just was and to tell all my employees about Jesus. She goes, you better get back in your car and tell those people about Jesus. I was like, this is why I didn't want to see you. I get back in my car. I'm heading to the bar. I call up a friend. His name's Brent. He's spoken here before, Brent Silkey. I say, Brent, will you pray with me? I feel like God wants me to do this. Brent prays for me. I go inside the bar. The DJ's playing, the music's loud. I look at the DJ like to signify to him and I go, Attention! Excuse me, I'm shaking. I'm not joking. I am shaking at this point. The DJ goes, oh, lowers the volume down. Now everyone in the bar beyond my employees is looking and staring at me. For about three seconds, I didn't know what to say. And then the Holy Spirit showed up in that bar room and began to literally anoint every single word. Before I even gave an invitation to follow Jesus, this man gets up from the bar one of the quietest workers that ever worked with me at Best Buy. I didn't say much at all. He gets up. He has tears streaming down his face. He comes, stands right in front of me. I'm like, what's this about? He opens up his arms, and he collapses into my arms. This big giant of a man is weeping in my arms. Little did I know, every single person in the bar, I'm not making this up, every single person in the bar stands up, gets behind this man, and like start weeping under the presence of God, and I'm giving a hug to all these random strangers and people in the bar. Jesus shows up and starts intervening in these people's lives. See these people end up coming to know Christ. And I say all that to say this. Is I am not anyone special. I just desire God to work through me and to be available whenever he wants me to be. 
And that doesn't mean that I get it right all the time and I've missed more opportunities more than I've probably done it right. But let me tell you one story that followed up after that bar scene. My buddy who picked on me, who made fun of me at the bar and different things like that at Best Buy, gave his life to Christ. One of the guys I never thought would give his life to Christ. Now he's leading and discipling other people in our church and leading small groups at his house every single week. God wants to work through available ordinary people to accomplish his plan and his glory. God is looking for those who are available. And your second point is this, is you and I are God's plan A for more of heaven on earth. You and I are God's plan A for more of heaven on earth. Why do I say that? Look at what the text says in verse 12. It says, late in the afternoon, can you imagine the disciples? The 12 came to him and said, Jesus, send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we're in a remote place here. I love the disciples. Hey, Jesus, do you remember the reason why we came to Bethsaida was we were going to withdraw and now all these people are here and it's great they're getting healed, like we're seeing God move, but it's getting dark now. Let's send them all away to the countryside because they're really hungry. There's a problem here, Jesus, so let's just send them away and then maybe we could get our own time. And I love Jesus' response right here in Luke chapter 12, verse 13, 9, verse 13. Jesus replied, you give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. In other words, disciples, you see a problem here? You see a need here that exists with 15,000 people, this city, this world? You see a need in the world, in the city today? You do something about it. You give them something to eat. The disciples sitting there, uh, 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 we could go into town and buy food for all these people. No, they couldn't go into town and buy food for all those people. They probably didn't have enough money. Jesus, right here, what he spoke over 2,000 years ago is the same principle that applies right here and right now. It's the same response that Jesus gives you and I sitting here in the room, that if you see a need or an injustice or something wrong in the world today, Rather than getting in small groups, bantering about it with their friends, talking about how big of a problem it is, what is it would happen if just you and I would just do something about it? If we would begin to feed people, if we would begin to step out in faith, and how many of you know, to feed people of over 15,000 there, it requires faith. It is impossible to please God without faith. And what God is looking for is people to rise up in faith in him and say, God, I will begin to feed one. I might not be able to feed everyone, but God, I can feed one. And the disciples, as Jesus says, you give them something to eat. They answer, Jesus, we have only five loaves of bread and two fish. Jesus, we only have five loaves of, two, of, five loaves of bread and two fish. Know what often we do? is oftentimes when God asks us to do something, we look at it with our own eyes and our own perspective. Let me just say this. God's economy is different than ours. God's ways and thoughts are higher than ours. And rather than giving God our excuses, we are merely called to just give God what we have. Rather than giving, looking at God and saying, but God, I don't have what everybody else has. God, I don't have as much money as somebody else. God, I'm not smarter than this person over here. God, I didn't get a degree in this. God, but I got bad grades in this. We are constantly looking at what we don't have versus at what we do have and just giving God what we do have and watching him do the miracle. God is looking for ordinary people that will just give them what they have and not their excuses. We are called to approach things with spiritual eyes, seeing the way God sees, asking for his heart. Yet so many of us are focused on so many of the details that we never even consider faith. Could it be that God leads you right where you're at and so that you'll respond in faith? Faith walks into a situation and rather than seeing the impossibilities, faith says, I know a God that can make this possible. Faith steps in the situation that says there's no way this can happen, but I believe God can make it happen. God is looking for the church to rise up in faith, and you and I are plan A for God bringing heaven here on earth. 
I think about students, young kids all over the country, as I get to travel and preach, that aren't looking at what they don't have, but they're looking at what they do have and just giving it to God and watching him multiply it. I was speaking at a youth convention not too long ago, and there was a young girl in the audience who heard a whisper from the Holy Spirit saying, I want you to give $1,000 to Speed the Light. If you don't know what Speed the Light is, it's a missions program where students across the country will give money to missionaries. They'll sacrifice. Your church participates in that. This young girl who's 12 years old, sitting at a youth convention amongst a bunch of people, the Holy Spirit says, give $1,000 to Speed the Light. A 12-year-old. Don't tell me God cannot work through young people. As this young girl dared to dream and say, God, what do I have? She looked around. She didn't know that she really had much. But what she did have was $400. You want to know what she did with that $400? The Lord prompted her to buy a pony. Because her family trains up ponies and sells them. So she took the $400 that she had saved up, bought a pony so it could be utilized as a missions pony. She took a step of faith. God said to give what she had. God said to do something. She surrendered the $400, bought a pony. She trained it for nine months, put it on an ad to try to sell the pony. No one was calling, no one was buying. She got discouraged, went to her youth group one night. Her youth leader said, what's the matter, Lydia? She goes, I've trained this pony for nine months. It's been on sale for over a month. No one has called once to buy it. The youth leader looked at her and said, girls, let's pray for Lydia. They prayed for Lydia that the pony would sell and it would be glorified God for missions. This young girl, no joke, gets a phone call two days later from a guy. Hey, I noticed your ad here that you got. Say, I don't know if anyone's put in an offer for that pony, but would you be willing to take $2,500 for that pony? She said, yes, <laughs> yes. God brought about $2,500 for a girl who heard the Holy Spirit whisper to give a thousand. This girl, rather than giving God her excuses, chose to step out in faith. And now heaven on earth is moved because of a young girl's faith to give what she have and watch God do the miracle and multiply it. I wonder, you can clap for that. When was the last time you risked it all? When was the last time you didn't play it safe? When was the last time you got out of your comfort zone? When was the last time you said, God, I want to give more to missions than I ever have before? Or saying, God, send me, I'll go. Right now, right now, there are probably eight retirees in the room, eight retired people in the room where God is calling you to go on the mission field and give your life to missions, yet you've yet decided to go. God is calling you to step out and go tonight. God uses young and old alike to go and accomplish his plans here on earth. It's the local church. It's the people in this room that are going to make a difference here in this city and around the world because of God choosing you to make a difference. I wonder if we would just take time to allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us what he would put in our hearts to do who he put on our hearts, the co-workers. When was the last time your heart broke for your co-workers? When was the last time your heart broke for your family? By the way, if you want to get a heart that's broken for your city, go, by, go stand by the Urbandale City sign and pray and seek God over that sign and the population number until God breaks your heart for this city. 43,597 people live in Urbandale people that are here that need to be reached. Being here for three days, I've gotten to meet a lot of different people here in Urbandale. Opportunity to speak to people. Opportunity to love people. Opportunity to buy somebody Starbucks. Oddly enough, went to Hy-Vee this morning. Somebody paid for my family's breakfast in Hy-Vee, and I think it's someone from this church, so thank you very much. By the way, if you're looking for a good breakfast spot, go check out High V Fresh Market Grill. Seven dollars, eggs Benedict, y'all. Does not disappoint. It's great. I love the story of Lydia, 
But more than just hearing stories, that story can be lived out through you and I every single day. Who's going to be available and who will begin to understand? God, I believe that you want to break my heart in a new way to see hell emptied and to see heaven populated. Today it broke my heart at the gym. I was at the gym at Planet Fitness. And I hate what sin does. I hate how sin destroys. It breaks my heart being out in public, being at the gym, seeing so many people that may not know Jesus. How much do we have to hate people to not give the greatest solution that exists in the world and in our hearts right here and not tell them about it? God, break our hearts for this city. God, break our hearts for this world. Jesus said, wait until I pour out my spirit and there you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The whole purpose of the Holy Spirit coming to baptize you is not so you can say that you speak in tongues, it's so that you can be an empowered witness for Christ. I know plenty of people that speak in tongues that have never seen one person come to know Jesus. God's heart came for the lost. He came for the orphan, the brokenness, the lost people, those at the bars, those that are not here in the church. How miserable of a life would it be to spend our entire life coming to church and not once ever seeing someone far from Christ come to know him? You and I have a role to play in the kingdom of God. And there's an urgency and the time is now. There's never a bad time to be a nightlight in somebody's life. I think sometimes when we think about reaching the world or reaching people, we think we need to be this loud, boisterous preacher or this very charismatic individual. No, it's creating a nightlight in somebody's life. It's buying somebody's meal. It's helping carrying the groceries. It's help serve people. It's helping serve the less fortunate. 100 years from now, nobody will remember your name, but 100 years from now, people will still be lifting up the name of Jesus. This world is not about us. It's not about what we can get or accumulate. But this life is all about God and His glory living through us. It's magnifying Him to the world and to the city and people around us. God, help our lives to count. The reason why Paul was shipwrecked, abused, beaten, had a bounty on his head everywhere he went was because he had a love to know Christ, to share in his sufferings, and a love for people. God creating us a love for people. My last point tonight is this, is joy follows obedience. Joy will always follow obedience. Lately for me, it's been an overwhelming feeling for me personally to know that all I'll ever be in life is not some speaker, traveling guy who preaches the gospel, no, that is not what makes me excited, but what makes me excited is to know that all I am and all I ever will be is just a distributor of the gospel, a distributor of Jesus. If you notice in the rest of the story, it says God thanked, Jesus took the bread and loaves, thanked it, and then he handed it to his disciples to distribute to the people. All you and I are in the role in the kingdom of God are distributors of his grace and his love and forgiveness everywhere we go. We are his distributors. And how amazing would it be to watch a miracle from five loaves and two fishes and watch it feed over 15,000 people. Folks, Jesus said, I have said all these things to you so that your joy might be made complete. You're called to remain in me so that there's fruit that will bear in your life and fruit that will last and remain forever. Joy should mark the believer and every follower of Christ because there is so much joy in obeying and following Jesus. Just recently at a car mechanic where we'd seen him for 30 years in our family, my dad, when he was serving the Lord, went over to his station, would tell him about Jesus and bring him a cup of coffee. My mom would make him some cookies and baked goods and bring him down every so often. An honest mechanic, an honest man. 
but really didn't want anything to do with Jesus. Kind of a hard man, rougher kind of guy, didn't want anything to do with Jesus. Well, a couple months ago, I saw him and he said, Micah, he said, would you pray for me? I've never heard him say this before. Would you pray for me? I was like, what's going on? He said, I found out I have cancer and it's not looking too good. I said, Rich, I am going to pray and fast every single day until I see you become healed because I believe God's going to heal you and he's going to demonstrate his power in your life. The cancer got worse. A month goes by. I get a call that Rich is in the hospital. A liter of fluid is dripping from his lungs every day. I go into the hospital. I see him laying there. I spend about an hour on his bedside. And right before I get up to leave, he looks at me. He says, Micah, he said, I got a question for you. And I said, yeah, what's going on? He said, I had some Mormon guy at my shop uh, come to my house and like put oil on me and prayed for me. And he goes, what do you think of this Mormon stuff? What, what are your thoughts on it? And my buddy and I were there, understood the question later. But Rich was asking, Micah, where does my soul go? Micah, what happens to my soul? Micah, I need to know the truth. So right then and there, we go next to his bedside. We grab his hand. We begin sharing this simple gospel message, which is this. Rich, one thing I do know is this. Is Rich, I was once lost. I was once in a dark place. I was once in a hurting place. But in my darkness and in my lostness, I received something I never thought I deserved. I received a grace that met me and a love that found me. And his name is Jesus, Rich. He doesn't expect you to get your act together to come to him. He comes to you in the middle of your brokenness, Rich. He saves you and he redeems you. <laughs> Rich starts doing what I'm doing. He starts crying in his bed. He's a 60-year-old man. He has a goatee. His head's kind of shaved. And he's sitting in his bed. He starts crying. I say, Rich, do you want to receive Jesus as Lord of your life? He barely get it out. He says, yes, yes. I said, Rich, repeat after me. We're going to pray. We begin praying for him to receive Christ. And the minute we say amen, Rich goes, oh. He said, I feel like a weight has just taken off of me. And he said, Micah, I've never had a more glorious moment in my entire life. One week later, Rich passed away. He was now in heaven with his father who met him a week before he passed. The reason why I'm so emotional is because it's really personal. For 30 years, it started with my father going to him, putting a seed of the gospel. My dad passes away, my mom's still bringing him cookies. It took multiple people meeting this mechanic to get to a spot on his deathbed to say, Michael, what's really going on with my soul? To experience the peace of God. All I was was just a harvester. People had been planting, praying for years for rich, and all I was was just one guy who came and picked it over. We are called to plant seeds everywhere we go. We are called just to scatter seeds everywhere we go. To plant seeds, seeds of truth that will bear maybe years down the road. No, it was powerful is that one seed yielded a harvest of a couple hundred people where I was asked to do the funeral and I saw a room full of people give their lives to Christ that knew rich too. We are called to be available and God is looking for those who are available. God says you are my plan A to bring about healing to the injustices on the screen and the people around you in your life. And boy, is there so much joy in just obeying Jesus. I cannot tell you how many times I've just been in public and people will start crying because they encounter the grace of Jesus or they hear about Jesus. I wish I could share story after story. This is my wife behind me. And she's going to sing for you, and I want you just to sit there in just a little bit. I want to publicly honor and thank my wife, because while I was preaching every single night, which you did not see, was my wife in a hotel room with two kids, taking care of them so I could be away to pray and sermon prep for every single night that's here. What we get to do is a team. It's a ministry that we get to embark on together. And I've asked her just to sing over you, and before she does that, I want to leave you 
with five practical things that you can play out in your life this year. One of these five might apply. Number one, go on a missions trip. If you've yet to go on a missions trip, go on a missions trip. You begin to get God's heart. Number two, give to missions. How do you move heaven on earth? Be generous in your missions giving. Missions giving is beyond your tithe giving. It's a separate offering. Number three, start praying regularly for a broken heart for people. Know what I love about tonight's message? Is night one was all about getting more of heaven in us. Night two was all about seeing more of heaven in our family. But you want to know what happens? Every time you draw near to Christ, he will always lead you to the broken things and the broken people in this world. He will always lead you to the lost every single time. Because that is the mission on his heart, and that's the mission of the church. Number four, look for ways to bless people every day. And number five, step out in faith this year. Believe for the impossible, something beyond you that forces you into Christ. Step out in faith, do something radical. Ask God, what do you want me to do? Who do you want me to pray for? Who have you commissioned me to bless? Do you realize in your workplace, every time you show up, you bring the presence of God and the room changes? Do you realize your city of Urbandale? It changes because of the presence of God that exists in the people here in Urbandale. Do you realize economies change where the gospels preached and lived out? Ephesus was being changed, and there was an uproar in the city of Ephesus because the God of Artemis was seeing a decline in sales of their little trinkets for the people. God's gospel will change cities. Five things for you to think about, pray about, as my wife sings a song or two. And then I've asked the worship team after she's done ministering to come as we close out and worship to God and seeing more of heaven in our city and our world today. Fraud, whatever I do, wherever I be, it is my God that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me by his own hand. His faithful follower will be for by his hand he leadeth me. Sometimes it seems how deep is gloom sometimes where Eden's bowers bloom by water still or troubled sea it is my God that leadeth me he leadeth me he by his own hand he leadeth me his faithful follower i am gonna be since by by his hand he leadeth me oh he's faithful Always faithful, always true, always true, always there. And when my time on earth is done, when by thy grace, 
the victory's won, even death's cold stare. I will not flee, since God through Jordan. My God through Jordan, oh, my God. Through Jordan, He leadeth me. Oh, He leads me on through mountains and valleys, through rivers unknown. He leads me. gonna be a faithful follower, faithful follower, since by his hand he leadeth me. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. And look full on his wonderful face in the things of earth will glow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. Oh, in the light, in the light, oh yes, everything grows dim, strangely dim, in the light of His glory. So we turn our eyes upon Jesus and look full on his wonderful face in the sea. On my mom's side, her dad, the Lutheran pastor who turned into a mailman, before he passed away with pancreatic cancer, the one thing that was said about my grandpa was that he would not stop talking to every person that came into his room and said, do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Let me tell you about Jesus. Every person that would come in the room, every nurse, every doctor, do you know Jesus? You have to know Jesus. You got to know Jesus. And my grandpa said, his one regret in life was waiting on his deathbed to tell people about Jesus. He said, I wish I would have had an urgency to tell Jesus, tell people about Jesus before I took my last breath. If you want to know what it means to be successful in this world, I leave you with five ways to do it. Number one, keep your eyes on God. Number two, keep your eyes on God. Number three, keep your eyes on God. Number four, keep your eyes on God. And number five, keep your eyes on God. A glimpse of him into his face and to his eyes reminds you and I 
our identity as sons and daughters and are commissioned to be ambassadors to rule and reign with him here on earth. There is a move of God that's happening within this local assembly, within this local body. Within the past month and a half, God has done extraordinary things. We have set aside and dedicated four nights to see more of heaven, to intentionally set time away. But where more of heaven really happens is the minute you leave this place and set up homes that honor God, rooms dedicated to pray in, co-workers that you're praying for. Jesus said, blessed are those who hear what I say and then do them. I'm going to invite our worship team to come on up and close us in a song or two of worship here tonight. I would encourage you, if you don't already have a list of people that you're praying for or believing for, I want to encourage you to find a list of people to see them come to know Christ, to believe for them. God, I thank you for this assembly and for this gathering of people and how your spirit is pouring out on all flesh. It's moving about the audience. It's calling people by name. I thank you that this is a church that catches God's heart and God's generosity for the lost by sowing into missions, supporting missionaries that go. But Holy Spirit, I pray in a specific prayer right now, I pray you would tug on the young people's heart and the old alike in the room to be sent out as missionaries all over the world and to be sent out as missionaries right here and right now for such a time as this. God, I pray you to begin to multiply the miracle by literally us just laying down what we have. The custodial job we work, the fast food job that we work at, the Urbandale High School we attend, the different things in our life, we give them to you so that you might multiply a miracle through us to distribute your love and grace to a world. I pray now, God, a blessing over every family here every head patriarch, matriarch, every generational, whether faith or not of faith, I pray a blessing on their family. I pray they'd walk in the favor of God. I pray your face to shine upon them, your grace to go before them, your favor to lead the way on their life. I pray, God, they would know the joy of what it means to obey you and follow you every step of the way. God, I pray for those who are downcast and hurting, I pray you'd remind them of how awesome you are and how caring you are and how you lift off the burdens of those who are downcast, that you care for those who are here tonight. I just pray for a sweet sense of your presence as we close our service in lifting up the name of Jesus. Oh, what a beautiful name that you are. And yet at the same time, you're the God of this city. I thank you, God, that you're the God over Urbandale. You're still on the throne and you're the God of this world. And we thank you for how wonderful and how beautiful your name is in following you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Church, would you stand? The altars are open if you would like to come and respond however you see fit. I encourage you to respond in whatever way that you need to respond tonight.